And we're live. With Paranormal Dash Spirits, a place to come to get our booze on. We talk about the booze, the things that go bump in the night. And I get to do that with my booze. I'm Mike Black. To my left is my lovely wife, Alyssa Black. Hello. <laughs> Greetings. And jolly good holidays. Hey, it is almost the holidays. It's like next week. Um. Yep, Monday. Yeah. And it's here so fast. So tonight we got a, a great story for you guys. And um, the reason that so many accounts of the paranormal fall under such intense scrutiny is because the person telling the story hasn't established their credibility. You know, it's like when the guy next to you on the bar stool that's, you know, that you don't know and he's, he's slurring his words and all that and he tells you that he got probed by an alien <laughs> last week. You know, you're not apt to believe him, and you, you shouldn't, mean? and you probably shouldn't. But let's say when Jimmy Carter or Ronald Reagan tell you or describe their encounters with uh, unidentified flying objects, you aren't apt to believe them. Their position alone lends credence to what they're saying. Okay. Another reason is that there's, it's not very frequently corroborated with evidence. Our story tonight has the benefit of having both those things. We have a guy that was a NASA engineer for 15 years. And along with that, there are multiple witnesses that saw the same thing he did. And there is video and audio uh, evidence. And we'll put the audio evidence or the actually the video evidence in uh, later in the show. So before we get to that, though, let's talk about all the places that you can find us. You can find us on YouTube at 3B Paranormal Spirits. You can find us on, and don't forget to like and subscribe when you get there. If you do nothing else, just hop on there and subscribe, and I promise you we won't spam you. Um, there's a We have a Facebook page, that's Booze with Benefits. We have Instagram, and that's Paranormal underscore D-A-S-H, spelled out, underscore Spirits. And it's the same for Instagram TikTok and X. We also have a website at paranormal spirits.com. Um, on that website, we have all of our liquor reviews uh, for the different liquors that we drink uh, on our shows. We also, that's a place where you can get to our boutique site, our Boozy's Boutique, and that's where you can pick up all your swag, your uh, Boozy swag, like Boozy's Koozies and Boozy Cups and Boozy Dad Caps and Boozy Racerback Tees and Boozy Regular Tees and pretty much anything that can be turned into swag, we've done it and put it on that <laughs> site. There's like, I think the last count there was 500 and some odd items that I've actually got on that site for okay. uh, Boozy Swag. So, tonight we start off every night with our liquor, our booze, our B-O-O-Z-E. And tonight I am drinking Bushmills Prohibition Recipe. It is an Irish whiskey, and it's also a limited edition uh, Irish whiskey. It's not expensive at all, and it is great. Alyssa, what are you drinking? I'm in Ireland, not Scotland today. You're Scotland, not Ireland. I mean, I'm Scotland, not Ireland. Sorry. Mm. And I'm drinking Scarabus Isla Single Malt, malt Scotch Whiskey. It sounds like I've already gotten into it, but I really haven't. <laughs> How many glasses have you had of that already? None. Absolutely none. But this is a great peated scotch that is not going to break the bank, and it has a great flavor. So so it's as good as Lagavulin? No. Okay. I said it wasn't going to break the bank, <laughs> and I said it was good. Sometimes you have to sacrifice. In the case of scotch, sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit of taste and depth. It's still, it's a, it's a great liquor, I think. I think so, too. Okay, let's talk about the booze. Let's get scary. Okay. And I want to tell you the story about Bill Vale, who I mentioned before was a NASA engineer. He had worked, all, everything that he had done, had all the jobs he had throughout his life required uh, great intelligence and focus um, and, and logic. This is not a guy who's just flies by the seat of his pants. Everything is dress right dress and everything's got to be nailed down for him. And he had, uh, when he was in the Navy, he worked as a sonar supervisor on a nuclear submarine. 
Uh, he spent uh, a lot of years as a pilot, uh, 15 years as a robotics engineer for NASA. Uh, he also worked as an operations quality manager for a company that produced spaceflight critical hardware for NASA. So he is this guy's no legit. dummy. Yeah, he's no dummy to begin with. And all of these jobs uh, require a great attention to detail, keen observation, mm-hmm. um, the ability to work um, in surroundings where he's got a lot of pressure on him and without losing his cool. And But Bill, was he is about to experience in this story some of the most intense pressure that uh, he's ever experienced in his life. So our story begins around 2002. Bill, um, his life is taking a sudden turn. He has a divorce from his wife that is getting finalized in 2002. And he's kind of feeling burned out and just needing a fresh start. So he moves a few hundred miles uh, back to Texas. I believe he was uh, in Virginia, if I remember correctly. But Bill quit his job in the aerospace industry and moved back to his hometown uh, there in Arlington where his brother was. And his younger brother, Bob, and he reconnected. And he was looking around to do anything other than what he had been doing. He didn't need that or want that kind of pressure that he had before. So his brother, Bob, is working at this water purification company. And they're going door-to-door selling and, and servicing these water pur- purification uh, devices. So Bill applied there. And, of course, <laughs> he says, hey, I'm a rocket scientist. So they hired him. Uh, much less stressful or technical than his previous jobs. I would say. Yeah. And um, during this time, he was looking for a house, and he found one well within his budget, um, so much so that the deal seemed almost too good to be true. And it was like they were just trying to give the house away. Well, (laughs) if it's on paranormal spirit, you know what that means. It was too good to be true. Again. Uh, Again. You know, it's one of those deals. If it's on this show, it's going to be about a house that you shouldn't get. So anyway, Bill takes a new job and he'd been on the job for about two months and they had a call for someone to be at a residence on a Saturday evening at exactly 5 p.m. Not a minute sooner, not a minute later. So Bill was wanting to impress his new employer and his coworkers. So he took the call. He grabbed a bite to eat. And got to the house a little bit early, so he waited down the street until exactly 5 p.m. At exactly 4.59, he starts walking up to the house. As he turns onto the sidewalk, he can hear a woman screaming from inside the house. And as he gets closer, it gets louder and louder, and he notices that the door to the house is ajar. And... So he steps up just inside the entryway and he can hear this woman screaming. And as he steps up into the entryway and he looks down the hallway, there's three men kneeling in a circle and she's walking around them. And she's got a Bible in one hand and touching these men on their head. And she's screaming out, get out in the name of Christ. I command you leave these men. And oh no, so I'd be backing it up and leaving. And Bill is a, he is about to leave. Uh, he said that took weird to a whole new level, no doubt. That Bill. was a quote. He knows that this is just too strange for him, and he's ready to leave. And just as he's about to turn around and walk out of the house, this woman who's screaming and walking around these men, holding the Bible and exercising or casting out whatever she's doing. She looks directly at Bill and she just points her finger at him Uh oh, like this. And Bill's like, <gasps> you know, so he <laughs> runs out of the house. He gets back to the truck and he calls dispatch and he says, look, don't you ever send me back. That's what he said. He said, I, you know, I came out here to do the job. This is way too crazy for me. Uh, furthermore, if you want this job done, he said, or this call made, somebody else is going to have to do it. He said, because I refuse to do this, which I, I'm right there with Bill. I'd have been deuces I'm out and I'm not coming back, period. The end. Also hoping to get away unscathed. Hmm. But because it's on the show, I'm assuming that did not happen. Uh, no, he got scathed. Mm, mm. 
Not good. You know, I've always wondered about that word unscathed. What is scathed? <laughs> you know? Well, unscathed is clear. Without, so I'm assuming right. scathed is going to be not. Right. So Bill gets home and this is after the ordeal that night and uh, that evening. He gets home and he cooks himself up some dinner and he's sitting in his easy chair watching TV. Got his tray in front of him. And as he's sitting there, his bedroom is off to the left. And he sees something run by on the floor. Something scamper by. He could, Actually, he says he couldn't tell if it ran by or flew by because it went so fast. And he just sees it out of the corner of his eye. So, And he thinks to himself, well, great, now I have a rat you know, or a bird, or maybe it's a bat in my mm -hmm. house, probably flew down the chimney and got in the house, right? Bill puts his food away, and he turns on the lights in the house. He starts looking around for this thing, and uh, they'd been off because he'd been watching TV, but he searches the entire house looking and listening for whatever it was that he saw, sees nothing. And he spends about an hour and a half looking and trying to find this thing, which I get it. If I thought I had a rat running, I, I just wouldn't give up. You know, it's, I'm going to find this thing. He can't find it anywhere. And I mean, he looks everywhere. Um, and at this point, he's like, he doesn't know where it went or if it went, if he even actually saw it. So he thinks maybe, you know, maybe he just imagined it. Mm -hmm. So later that night, Bill's laying in bed. And he feels like what is a small creature, mm -mm. his mm -mm. words, that runs over the foot of his bed and his feet. So Bill is instantly awake and he's got his feet drawn up. And he decides that whatever he saw earlier in the evening is now in his bedroom and it's run across the feet. It's in his bed. So I, just, I know it gives, nope. me the, no. <laughs> gives me the willies thinking about it. And uh, he could tell by the weight of it running across feet. It's probably about the size of, you know, a, a rat or something like that, a rodent, a small rodent, so maybe a squirrel or something. But this is the last thing that he needs or wants in his house is this rodent running across his bed in the middle oh, of the night. Oh, cool. Ugh. So Bill gets up. He turns on every light in the room. The door to his bedroom is shut, so he knows that it's, in there. it's already in there and it, it hasn't gotten out. And he looks under the dresser. He looks in the closet. He looks under the bed. He looks everywhere. He can't find this thing. And as he's doing this, he's stopping periodically just to, you know, listen. just to listen. Maybe you can hear it scampering around or something. Nothing. Doesn't hear anything. Doesn't see anything. And so Bill, being the, the logical person that he is, um, you know, he quite literally was a rocket scientist. Yes, literally. You know, he begins to think, well, maybe I dreamed this. Again. And he says, it's quite possible that what he saw earlier had manifested itself in my dreams. And I dreamed that this thing ran across my feet. Because, you know, he thinks he saw something earlier. So maybe that he's thinking about this while he's asleep. You know, his mind's turning. And he dreams that this thing ran across his feet. And it's just so super realistic that it wakes him up. So he cajoles himself for being so silly and he goes back to sleep. Nope. And no. I, well, I mean, what do you do? You can't I find it. it. It's no, nowhere I there. It. And it's I like, it. it makes absolutely no sense that it's not there. So it's like, dude. I've imagined it. You've imagined obviously. this. Let's go back to sleep. Yes. So he goes back to bed. He gets back to sleep about 2 30 in the morning. He is awakened by his bed shaking violently and it wakes him up and he's like, oh my God, he said that the bed was rocking so hard that it ne he nearly rolled out of the bed. That's how hard the bed was, was shaking. And well, he's in Texas, so it's not an earthquake. Well, and that's what he thinks, you know, he jumps up and as soon as he gets out of bed, the bed stops shaking. So he realized that there's, it doesn't seem like an earthquake because the bed was the only thing that was moving. Nothing else in the room is moving around. Nothing's falling. Nothing's breaking. 
Uh, he looks out the window to see if maybe there's cars with the alarms with the lights going off. None of that. Um, so, so it's he, just his bed. It's just his bed. So he goes back to the bed and he thinks, well, you know, maybe I was having a nightmare. You know, I've, I think I've already had a nightmare with this thing running across my feet. And maybe that's what it was. And I was shaking in my bed, causing the bed to shake. And it wasn't the bed shaking me. I was shaking the bed. Okay. Right. It's a possibility. Okay. All okay. right, Bill. Explain it away as you wish. So anyway, he, so he goes over the bed and he tries to move the bed. <laughs> and this is one of those large four poster beds, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like we have. Yes. You know, except it's, we have the sleigh bed, but it's, it's huge. It's heavy. He didn't shake the bed, you know. And he can barely budge it, uh, budge the bed, just trying to lift it or move it, you know. So Bill's like, okay, there's got to be a logical explanation right. for what happened. There, there just has to be. So he hops on the internet. He says, well, might have been an earthquake. So he gets on there and he starts looking. It is Texas, but I mean, earthquakes are it's pretty possible. damn rare here. Yes, it but is. It's extremely rare. Um, he couldn't find anything in the news or on the internet about, uh, there being any kind of earthquake anywhere near Arlington where he lived. So he, he starts wondering, well, what else could it be? Well, you know, there's that air force base. It's nearby army air force base. So maybe there was a jet and it, there was a sonic boom and that's what shook, you know, Okay. maybe that shook him. Um, doubtful, doubtful. He said, but you know, he said that's highly doubtful that a sonic boom would, would rattle just the bed, you know, it might rattle the windows. Right. And so he's like, well, he says, what else could it be? Well, we're in Texas. So we do, we have a lot of oil drilling here, not a lot there around Arlington, but I mean, there is uh, drilling done in Texas. So maybe they, they were drilling and they hit some gas or they had some kind of explosion. And this is what I felt. And I just thought it was my bed shaking. So he searches, he can't find anything about anything like this, right? And so Bill, in his own mind, has not connected the bed shaking with the thing running across his feet and the thing that he saw yet. They're they're all separate instances, you know? Okay. He hasn't tied them together yet. But he does, however, start to get a sense that either something is wrong with him and he's losing his mind going a little wacko or that there's something really weird going on. Mm -hmm. So he gets on the internet and he starts looking even further while he's on there searching for a rational explanation for all this crazy bed shaking stuff. His internet drops. Now this is the same night he gets on there and he, so he tries to troubleshoot, uh, all to no avail. The, uh, so he hops on the phone with tech support for his internet service provider. And the tech, you know, welcomes him onto the call and, you know, thanks him for letting them be a service like they always do and ask him what the problem is, you know, and he, so Bill gives him his information and a callback number, which is standard. And the guy says, no problem. He says, we can take care of the issue. He said, let me just put you on hold for a minute. And He's sitting there listening to the hold music and he starts hearing this staticky sound that's like distortion. Okay. And at the same time, he's hearing this voice and it's a really low voice and it's speaking in some language that he doesn't know. Uh, it sounds almost guttural and threatening. And so Bill is really, you know, like unsettled by this. He's like, what, you know, what is this? And finally he just hangs up. He just hangs the phone up and puts it down. A few moments later, the phone rings. So Bill picks it back up, you know, with trepidation, I'm sure. But he picks it up and he's listening. It's a guy from the internet company calling him back saying, um, Hey, uh, I got your, your services back up. And Bill says, let me ask you something. He said, did you hear that strange voice that was on there? He said, you know, he said, I've never heard that before, but yes, I did hear that. He said, I don't understand how that happens. We have a very secure phone system 
and it's kind of locked down to prevent anybody else from hijacking or accessing the phone, right? Right. So he's like, I don't, I'm not sure how that happened, but it did happen. So he said, yeah, I heard it. And, um, so he corroborated what he heard. So then Bill's like, okay, well I can't, I didn't imagine that. Right. Like, I think I imagined all these, this critter and my bed shaking. Right. So anyway, the, the tech tells him, well, your internet's back up. Bill thanks him, you know, for, for helping out. And, um, so the next day, uh, this is after the incidents, not before. This is all in one night. Yeah, this is all in one night. Okay. So the next day he gets up and he notices that these birds are gathering outside of what kind his. Of, what kind of birds? Well, he says doves and other birds will begin gathering in the trees outside of his home. So he calls a realtor. And he says, hey, you know, has this ever happened before? And he says, no. And he says, actually, that's that's kind of baffling. You know, in uh, Helvetic, the there was the gathering of the birds that was attacking the car as they were coming out to the house. From yes, there. yes. So, you know, that was, I don't know why, but it, I mean, but anyway, so the realtor's kind of baffled by this. He doesn't understand why these birds are gathering. It's never happened before. Nobody's ever told him about it. Okay. Um, also, Bill starts noticing that there is this pervasive smell. But to say, I, there's a smell, isn't there? Yeah, but it's not rotting flesh. It's cooking bacon. It smells as if there is bacon cooking in the house 24-7, which I think would be wonderful. <laughs> but I love I'm not that here smell, for that, but... But if I couldn't explain where, it was, if there wasn't actually bacon on the stove and, if, and, you know, we were cooking it up to eat, then I don't think I'd be too happy with that. But um, as he's walking through the house, there's cold spots all through the house. Uh, they become a regular occurrence. Um, Bill can't find a rational explanation for it. Um, he has the air conditioner checked out. Um, insulation's good. There's not a draft. Nothing he could come up with to make rational sense of what he was experiencing. Can't figure out where the smell's coming from. Mm-mm. And at night, things are getting worse. Uh, they're getting darker, more sinister. And there's this constant sensation of these things darting oh, across gosh. his feet. He's still never seen it, though. He has only out of the corner of his eye. Okay. That's the only time he's ever seen it. Okay. Never directly full on, Mm-mm. I know what this is type situation. Right. There's a little while later, Bill is sitting in his um, living room, sitting in his easy chair. I guess that's his place to eat while he watches TV. Of course, he's a, you know, a, a fella with that is out. Of, he's divorced now. I don't think he's in the dating world, evidently. So he just sits home and eats TV dinners and watches TV. But Okay. Uh, but that's his thing. And so he's sitting down for dinner and a water bottle. I thought you were going to say bug. And I'm like, nope. A water bottle comes flying out of the kitchen into the living room and he sees it coming and he moves his head over and the bottle hits right behind him. As soon as the water bottle hits, the lights start flickering and then they go completely out. Bill goes to his closet, grabs a flashlight turns a flashlight on and he hears something move above him. He shines the light up and he looks to the top of his closet. There is like most people's closet. There's this heavy box that's up on the top shelf, several heavy boxes. One of them is completely suspended above the shelf shelving. And Bill said that the box just slams down into the shelf as some, as if someone had forcefully thrown the box back down onto the shelf. Mm, so mm, mm. <laughs> that was I'm out. That was Bill's moment to go. You know what? This is not. There's nothing rational about this. I can't explain this. He said that was his moment. I'm not imagining this. Anymore. I'm not imagining this. This is not craziness. He said. So he said this falls under the realm of paranormal and. No other way to that he can reason this. Um, after he accepts that that's what's what this happening. is, yeah. 
all the phenomena, the supernatural stuff starts kicking into high gear. And it was like it needed it to be accepted. And it- I don't know. It's like, okay, you know, now that you know it's real, we're really going to put it on you. So he's having all kinds of problems with the electronics in his house, uh, flickering lights, his computer's failing, the television. Uh, they'll just start up on their own. They'll turn off on their own. And a lot of the technicians that came out and were in Bill's house said they had never seen anything like what they saw at his house. They'd never experienced that before. That's always reassuring. The phone would start calling people. It's drunk dialing. It was butt dialing in the middle of the night, yeah. All odd hours of the night, but usually around 3 a.m. is when this phone would start dialing out. The witching hour. Mm Mm-hmm. So Bill called the phone company in an attempt to find a solution to the problem. During the call with the representative, the strange, aggressive voice that he had heard before comes back on the phone. Nothing but static. Uh, In a language he doesn't understand. Yeah, and the representative confirmed he heard it as well. And he says, I don't understand how this happens. So finally... Billy Bob needs to leave. So Bill... (laughs) So he's... He wants confirmation. He thinks he might be going nuts. He truly thinks I, that he I might could, be I could see that. actually losing his mind. He tells Bob, his brother, hey, you know, some stuff's been going on around the house. Doesn't really fully disclose what's been going on. Only oh, no. that there's, you know, I'm hearing some stuff around the house and, you know, he didn't tell him the whole story. Okay. So, but he needs Bob to help confirm this for him. So he invites Bob over to the house. And he says, he tells Bob or ask him, he said, go stand in my closet. So Bob like, what? So Bob does, you know, he's anything for his brother, I guess, you know? So he goes and stands in the closet and Bill reaches out and shuts the door to the closet. As he's inside it. While he's inside it. He said, now turn the lights off. So his brother, (laughs) he complies. He turns the lights off inside the, uh, the, the closet, closet. Mm-hmm. and Bob's thinking this is a, a really strange request, but you know, he's going to play along and cause he's worried about Bill, you know, because it's like, he's not acting himself mm-hmm. and, um, do not tell me something touches him. Oh man. So Bob's in there. And while he's in there, he said that something reached out Mm-mm. and grabbed, it felt like something has grabbed his legs or grabbed one of his legs. Uh, two boxes fell off the shelf while he was in there. And something hit him in the face. He thinks it was the cord, the hang, the string from the... Um, light. From the light. Yeah, he thinks it was that that had reached out and slapped him in the face. And Bob said in an interview later, he said, you know, he said there was some stuff that went on in there. He said, but he said there was nothing that... He said, my family, we're all very sound-minded, and we don't spook very easily. So there was no reason to run out screaming, ah, like a little girl. And, you know, ah, the place is haunted. The place is haunted. He said, but I came out. And so Bill asked him, well, what do you, you know, did anything happen? What do you think? And Bob, all he would say to Bill at the time was, I think you need to clean up your closet. And that was it. Oh, no. So poor Bill. So Bill still doesn't know, right, that Bob knows. Bob knows there's something not right. Poor Bill thinks he's going nuts. But anyway, so Bob's been talking to this friend of his who was a sound engineer um, named Michael. And so Michael, I think, had worked with uh, Bill previously. Okay. And so he was telling about the things that he was hearing so Bill calls him one day just to check in, and as he's talking to him, this staticky sound comes on, and you have this uh, this voice talking. So they're both sitting there hearing this, and Bill starts yelling out over the phone. He, you know, after a little bit, he yells over the phone because he realizes this thing is evil. You know, it's not okay. just a, a ghosty thing. This is evil. So he's hollering to Michael, hang up, hang up. Don't listen to it. It's evil. So 
Michael can't hear this. All he can hear is the voice and the static. Oh, he can't hear Bill. He can't hear Bill. Bill can't hear Michael. All the, all that he can hear is this voice and the staticky sounds. Right. So anyway, he, um, Michael being a sound engineer comes to his mind. Hey, I'm going to record this. We'll find out what the hell this is. So he's got the equipment right there in his office. He grabs it. He sticks the mic over to the phone and he catches like a minute and a half of it that he records. Right. And he's sitting there and about a minute and a half into the conversation, uh, it it stops. The static stops, the voice stops. And Bill says, are you okay? You know, you okay? And he said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, he said, but he said, wait, he said, "I, I got great news. I caught it. You know, I recorded it. He said, let me play it back for you. It's blank. And it's blank. It's completely blank. You can hear Bill screaming out to Michael, Michael, don't listen to it. Hang up. Don't listen. But you don't hear anything else. It's just blank. Clear noise. How do I know? And yeah. So, uh, but he caught a full minute and a half of this where he can hear it. Bill can hear it. But the microphone doesn't hear it. No proof. Mm-hmm. No voice was captured. And Michael said in an interview later, he said, I know how to use the equipment. He said, I've recorded thousands and thousands of hours. I'm sure if he's a sound engineer, he's recorded all kinds of crap. He says, I know how to do it. I know what the software does. He says, I know how the equipment works. I know how the software works. He said, there's no reason why I shouldn't have recorded. There's no logical reason why I did not catch that. So Bob and uh, Bill invites Bob and his wife, Cindy, over for dinner. Okay. Cindy said she thinks it was because Bill was afraid and didn't want to be alone. Poor Bill. I know, right? I mean, seriously, dude, they're I'm by really, himself. Yeah, I'm really feeling for this dude. I mean, that would be horrible. Scared to death and you, you can't even sleep because something's running across your... Oh, How just, much longer is this? Like from the time, the initial time, like a couple of days, weeks, uh, don't know. Did Bob and Cindy come? I don't know. I'm just curious how long I, this has been going on. I don't on. know, but it, it's obviously been going on a while. Yeah. Um. So he invites uh, his brother and his wife over and they're sitting in the living room And as they're eating dinner, um, and Bob, it was really funny in the interview that I saw, he says, he said, Bill's quite the cook. He said, if he ever invites you over for steak, take him up on it. (laughs) And it was just really, it's really funny. These guys are originally from uh, Missouri. Okay. Joplin, Missouri. So they've got that kind of, not country sound, but Midwest. Midwestern. Kind of accent, or lack thereof, I guess, Mm -hmm. of accent, you know. Yeah. And um, so anyway, Bob says, take him up on it. That's funny. And uh, so anyway, they came over and they had eaten dinner and they were going to watch a movie after dinner. So they're sitting in the living room. Bill's in his easy chair. Bob and Cindy are on the sofa. And Bill jumps up and Bob's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And so Bill said, Bill had seen something run across the room in his room out of the corner of his eye while they're watching TV. And he doesn't tell Bob what he's seen. He just says, come sit in my chair. Bob, you know, again, he thinks it's a silly request, but he does it. He says, Bill's telling me, now just watch TV, just like I was watching. And so Bill's watching it. And next thing you know, Bob sees the thing running, these things going across a multiple Mm -hmm. things going across in front of the door. And he's like, Bob's kind of freaked out. So Cindy, she tries her seat next. Sure enough, she sees it too. Well, they all sat down. They drew out what they saw. And it's these little 18 to 24 inch creatures, bipedal, uh, that look like little short men. Burn it. Pot-bellied. Burn it. Big ears. Burn it. Okay. Uh, Mm -mm. So anyway. Burn it down. It's so anyway. So it's like an imp. An imp. What we would call an imp. Evil. Yeah, it's it's an imp. That's what we would call it. 
So they all see this and they get, they turn the lights on in the house. They know it, they know they're in the house, right? They just saw it mm-hmm. all through the house. They look everywhere, turn over everything, can't find it. And they're all a little bit freaked out. And or them, not necessarily an it, but them, them. Yeah. And, um, they can't find it. They can't find it anywhere. Bob and Cindy are trying to get Bill to come stay at their house. They said, dude, you, you got to get out. You can't stay here. You know, you need to, you need to come to our house and you can stay there until we figure this out. Bill felt like that if he left that night that he would be giving up, he says, I got to figure out a way to live here. He said, this is my house. I've got to figure this out. Cleanse and, it. And he felt like that if he gave in and left, that mm-hmm. it would just give them that much more power over him. Even though he doesn't even know what it is. Right. I'm sure he has some inklings. And after all. so Bill realized that this, this is not anything normal. So it must be paranormal or outside of normal. So he starts searching online and he days and days he's searching and he realizes that there is no way that he can figure out there's, there's no studies done. No, no scientific studies done or not very many. And there's no way to prove one thing or the other. I mean, you might catch evidence, but as far as how to deal with it, there's, there's no, there's nothing out there really, you know, from really? a scientific perspective. Okay. Okay. From the way he's looking at it. And so he decides I need help. I'm, I need a paranormal investigative type group to come out and figure out what this is, figure out what this is and help me get rid of it or help me live with it or whatever I'm going to do. So he wanted a group that had a, you know, a scientific approach to dealing with this. So he, he finds as opposed to like religious, I'm assuming. Right. Okay. So, and he had had many people come out and try to help him with it, but they were all just kind of, you know, they weren't very scientific about their approach and that bothered him. Okay. I see that. You know, um, they were kind of spiritual and hoodoo and, you know, these mediums and all this. And and knowing him as a scientist, he wants more of a scientific approach. So he finds this group called, DST, and they were based in the DFW area, okay, uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area. And so he calls them in 2005. Now he bought the house in 2002, okay. So he's been dealing with this. You ask how long three this years. Been. So this is three years at this point that he's been dealing with this. Ooh. Feels like and, a long time, yeah. It, I mm, so they tell Bill that they'll come out. And but they don't come out to look for ghosts. They come out to look for answers. Okay. So this impresses Bill. So yep. the investigation begins. Mm-hmm. And part of DST's procedure is they send a single team member out first to assess. And I assume that the reason they do that is so that if it's something simple and oh well this is a this isn't a demon scratching on your wall. It's a tree outside, you know, that's brushing up against the house. And that's where you're hearing the scratching sounds, right? They're coming to make sure it's actually paranormal as opposed right. to. Right. Okay. So first they send one person out. And so it was Brian, who is actually the one that, um, and we'll get to that later, but he's the one that, that started DST. He comes out and he notices this oppressive atmosphere inside the house. He said it just, it, you know, it weighed down on you. So he makes his rounds and goes around the house and he can't, he can't find anything that would be a reason for, to, to explain away the stuff that Bill's talking about, talking about. So he calls the team out. So the whole team comes out, um, and various experts in different fields, um, all of them have a critical eye, uh, for anything that can cause these strange phenomenons and stuff. So when they first came out, uh, or the second time they came out, uh, Brian Hall and it was two of his crew members arrive and they start looking for obvious answers again and they can't find anything. Um, and he said a lot of times, you know, it's just a bad AC unit, a creaky door, 
a branch outside scratching on the wall, you know, something like that. They looked at everything they could to determine whether or not this was paranormal or not paranormal. Nothing. They decide there's no rational explanation. So since Bill's room is the one that tended to get the most attention from this thing, things, um, and that's where the uh, most of the activity occurred, they set up there first, and they set up multiple cameras. I, th- I think it was like four cameras in there, infrared cameras. They set up uh, a laser beam grid. They called it uh, a laser grenade. Okay. And so basically what it does, it shoots out all these different points of light, laser light, so that if somebody breaks that beam, you can see the outline of that person by the mm-hmm. by the beams, right? And um, so anyway, they do this, and they set up a command center down in the kitchen, di- or over in the kitchen dining room area. And for a long time, nothing happens. And Bill and Brian and Sean, the youngest or the newest member, was in the kitchen watching all the cameras, listening. And so finally, uh, Brian suggests that Sean go up or go and try to interact with whatever it is in this room, right? Okay. So Sean goes into the room and lays down in Bill's bed and says, hey, if you're in here, show yourself. A few moments later, there is a mist that starts forming in front of the laser grid. And as you watch, you can see that this mist is kind of swirling around this laser and eventually the laser grid you can see the points of light start to move and then you hear this thud so it just fell off whatever they had it setting on so he'd been sitting there there all this time but now this thing is this mist is swirling around it and it you see the points of light just start to move like this and it falls and then boom it falls down right so they all run in there and sean jumps up he's screaming um (laughs) yeah he was screaming, hey, guys, guys, get in here, you know. So three of the four cameras were dead. They had been completely drained of energy. But one of the cameras was still running and caught uh, caught some footage. And I'll make sure that uh, we will have shared that on, on the show. There's an also ev- There was also an EVP that was caught that said, put it back, he's coming. Put it back, he's coming. Put it back, he's coming. So after the team packed up that night and they started to leave and they asked Bill if he was leaving and Bill said, no, he said, I've made the decision. I'm not going to run. I'm going to stay here in this house. It's mine. Bill's a martyr. I don't, I don't understand. I, I think that there's a lot going on and he probably should get out, but Bill gave the reasoning that if he were to give up on this and another family were to move in his house or that house, Then, and they had kids. It would haunt, it would do something to them. Then those kids would be subjected to the same thing that he'd been going through. And he just couldn't bring himself to do that. I mean. And I get that. I mean. Props to Bill for that. Props to Bill. That's very brave of him. But. I'm not sure that I would have had the same courage that Bill had. No. But. But I'm a wussy. (laughs) So. After the team leaves and Bill's, he yells out into the house that night. He says, show yourself and fight me. One of us is going to hell tonight. So Bill challenges this thing. And of course, it's just the activity just goes through the roof in. He is continually tormented by the, by the imps in the house. And also a new thing that's coming, which I, I think about that EVP that said, put it back, he's coming. It makes me think about now, not only does he have the imps in his house, there is a hat man that shows up. Black mask, fedora-shaped hat. You know, they you hear about hat man in mm-hmm, mm-hmm. urban legends and, you know, stuff like that. So, and shadow people. You right. know, we talked about the the ones that were the, mm-hmm. the hat man. Right. Well... And Bill felt that the hat man, so he said he had a hat and a trench coat, that he was the leader of the imps. He was the one that had control over them. 
And over the years, there have been uh, several attempts uh, to clear or exercise the house, and they have failed. Uh, there, he's had obviously Christians come out. He's had uh, Buddhists. He's had Reiki masters. All these different people that have come out and tried to clear out this negative energy. It doesn't work. And it didn't work. And Bill said he finally found the missing puzzle piece and it clicked into place. And he realized that no amount of anger or desperation or earthly knowledge could save him from this evil. So he called upon Christ to intercede. And one day he starts screaming at this thing and he screams, you are not invited. And under the authority of Christ, I demand you leave or be bound by your worst fears until final judgment. And he keeps repeating these words. And as he's repeating these words, all around him, there are these thuds and crashes and screams and smells. And this house is just imploding on itself because he is for 30 minutes straight. It's just over and over and over and over and over. That's all he does is tell this thing. You're not invited by the power of Christ. I demand you leave. And he just keeps on. So it says after 30 minutes of unrestrained malice, a new peace finally filled his home. In those days afterwards, he felt a new sensation amidst, amidst the peace. Something was still there. And he said, I know it's still here. It's just beneath the surface of the calm. He said, it's like a shark underneath calm waters. He said, I know it's there. But it's not messing with me. It's leaving me alone. It's subdued. He said, but it has never completely left. And it's like, it's just waiting there to... No. To sneak back in. Um, to what? He's in like a moment of... Well, you know... Vulnerability or something? I wonder if that's what he thinks. I Maybe so. And things will still happen. He said, but it's nothing like the evil that was there at the time before. Um, but it has left scars both physically and mentally. And he no still doubt. struggles with comfortably sleeping at night. Oh. When was this interview? 2002 is when it started and continues on to present. Still. Still. As far as I know. And he's had, since the haunting started, uh, he has had, uh, he's been hospitalized, hospitalized twice for heart attacks. Uh, they think due to stress. Absolutely due to stress. Mm -hmm. Lack of sleep. And the latest thing I've read, the, the there's differing of, a, accounts of this. One says from 2002 to present, but I've read further and it says that he moved to Arkansas. So I don't know if he retired there and moved to Arkansas and he's there with his son. But he also has two books that are out in, um, uh, you can pick them up on Amazon. Uh, one of them is only in a Kindle version. The other, I believe, is a paperback. But it talks about dealing with demonic entities and uh, oppression within a home and how to get rid of them and really? what he's learned. Yeah, it's really interesting, interesting. Uh, that he had done that he had written these books. But um, no, it's just a really crazy story, and you have to kind of give some credit because the guy. I mean. It's not Joe Blow who lives. <laughs> He's smart. He's yeah. I mean, not that people that aren't can't see things, but right, exactly. But this guy, you're going to have to give him some some credence, you know, because just for who he is and what he's done, he's a <laughs> he's a rocket scientist. So here's my question: Did it come from the lady, or was it in the house? Because it made it sound like with that story at the beginning. Mm -hmm. That it would be that one, but then he seems to think it's, which would lead me to believe it's attached to him, but he seems to believe it's attached to the home. 
So I'd be curious to know that when he moved, if it followed him. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is, he he doesn't think. He said he honestly does not feel like sh- the lady was trying to cast a demon onto him. I, it doesn't matter what he thinks she was trying to do. I know. I'm just saying that he feels like personally that that didn't happen. Okay. He says, "I was at the wrong place at the wrong time." He just I. I just mm-hmm. showed up. Okay. To me, the way the story is told about, okay, you have to be here at five o'clock. You think it was her? I don't know. It it sounds, I mean, okay, make sure you're here at this time so that Why? when I cast the demon out, <laughs> exactly. it, can Why? Ju- it can attach to you and you can take it off somewhere. But I don't know. It That's what it sounds like to me, but who knows? I, mm, I, mm, mm. No. You think that she cast it on him? Well, yeah, probably. I Maybe. Mean, I d- it's kind of, in the story, it's kind of hard to determine like when when he bought it, what it was, you know, but he seems to think it's attached to the home and not to him. Because it seems like to me, at least in the history that I've had of the stories and stuff, not my me personally, but if it's the person, then that person can go anywhere and it's going to go with him because mm-hmm. it's attached to him. But then again, there's people, I guess, that go places and a spirit will follow them and then it sticks with them and travels with them, but then I right. guess they could probably offload it into a home or something. Okay, so here's here's something that'll twist your noodle. Think about this. So when we've talked about the the shadow people, right? Yes. And the hat man, which yes. is just a version of the shadow person, right? Right. Okay, and we've talked about that. And one of the beliefs is that they that these creatures are interdimensional creatures okay okay so if they're interdimensional creatures then possibly these imps are jumping back and forth between dimensions and they're not really quote-unquote evil and he talks about the imps is not being evil later on in one of his personal accounts that i read he talks about the imps not being evil. Now that they're still there at the house, he said. Or at that point in time, he was still living at the house when I read this. And that the imps are still there, but the hat man was not. So I'm wondering, and he, he said they're not evil, they're like kids. He said they act like kids. So it makes me wonder if it's this interdimensional creature that, you know, like it's a pet for the hat man you know that like just that's goes his... back and forth even though the hat man has left right maybe this is and you know okay so you think about it and maybe that swirling that we saw maybe that is the vortex that presents itself when something is moving back and forth between dimensions remember the swirling yeah, yeah, in yeah. front of the the laser yeah. lights maybe it's a vortex and that's how they're moving back and forth well, how do you Maybe keep the, them somewhere else that's not here? I don't know. It's all it's all conjecture, but I'm just saying, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. Is no, as I mean, a I get it. That makes sense. I mean, you know, ye. Listen, I I don't think I could do it. There's some really good stuff out there. Um, there's a couple of uh, YouTubers out there that have done stories on this guy. There's um, a paranormal witness has a story. Uh, and there's a lot mm-hmm. of uh, personal accounts from Bill Vale about uh, his life and experience with this um, on that story. So it's it's worth a watch. I mean, if, if you got, what would you do? <laughs> would you stay there? Uh, it, there'd be a lot of factors. How afraid am I? Yes. Uh, do I think it's evil? Uh, do I have the opportunity to move somewhere else? Okay. You know, I could understand. Am that. I financially strapped and can't get out of that house? You know, we've had several stories we've done about houses where people pour their whole life savings into, the into house. a home, into a house. Yeah, and then they they're stuck. They can't get rid of it. They can't move. Hmm. You know, and I mean, it happens. You know, oh, so what yeah. do you do? You you can you can destitute yourself. You can. You know, put yourself in the poor house, but do you want to do that? Right. You know, to get away from this, or you just try to figure out a way to live with it until you you can 
get into a better place, you know, or another place. I just, yikes. Like, oh. I, I want to know if it went with him. I wonder if it went with him. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a, I'm curious. I'm, I'm probably going to end up reading the book. Yeah. Because uh, it's on Kindle. and Especially if you moved and like, I mean, that's not that far from us. I where, think the last I heard. Where is said house? Not that I'm trying to go in there. A, in a separate interview from the from the stuff I was drawing most of my my information from, in a separate interview, he was talking about that he now lives in Arkansas with his son. And I want to say he's retired or something like that. So, But, you know, he wanted to stay there so that somebody else can experience it. So it's like, did he keep the house? Did he, did he, is he renting it out? Is it like an Airbnb? Type? Oh, I'm not going there. I mean, it's close. It is very close. But no. It didn't give the address, though. So. I don't I don't want to be carrying nothing home with me like that. Mm-mm. I cannot. Negative I can't imagine. Rider. Like, I already don't sleep very well, and that's just because of my own self. Like, I can't imagine something <laughs> keep me up. Keeping me right. up like that. That's awful. Like, no, but it was... It. I think it's a Breeze Boogie story. I think that... Um, so, what... It, in the story, like, what has everybody settled on? Like, other people, like paranormal people that came to the house and such. Demonic? Oh, yeah, everybody. You know, that's the first thing to go to. If it, <laughs> Of course, if it was... Zach Bagans, you know, he would immediately go, oh, that's a demon, <laughs> you know, so. Well, but I mean, the, the but, stuff on the, on the, on the okay. phone line and everything. He, he says, he calls it demonic in uh, one of his books that he wrote. Uh-huh. He calls it demonic. Um, and he says later, you know, that the way he got rid of it was he called upon Christ to intercede and he screamed, you're not invited. And it went away. You know. Well, and under the authority of Jesus Christ, I demand that you be bound or leave, you know, so, mm. so probably better, demonic, better person than me. Mm. I know, right? It's just scary. So what do we think? Haunted? Not haunted? Demonic, if nothing else. Haunted, Definitely demonic, haunted. AF, yes, yeah. like I'm down. Get away. I think that's what it is. Absolutely. What'd you drink tonight? Scarabus. Mm. Isla Scotch. Pretty darn good. It is. What I drink tonight? Bushmills Prohibition. Limited edition. Limited edition. And Thomas Shelby. They say it's limited, but there's it's still on the shelves. You can still get it. I still go buy it. So, and I don't have a special hookup or anything. It's but got it such is, a cool bottle. Oh man, it's a cool bottle, and it's it's really really good liquor. It's it really not, is good. I don't particularly. It's better than I don't the like original Bushmills. Bushmills. Yeah, I don't like Bushmills White Label. Mm-mm. This stuff is really good, though. It is. So if you're down for some Irish, that's a great one. If you're down for some Isla Peated Scotch, that one is that one won't that break one is the good bank, too, yeah. bank, and it's yeah, it's good. And the only thing I got to say about it, as long as you're not sitting there drinking a hundred dollar bottle of scotch next to that one. Oh yeah, it's good if you keep them together and if you, you can compare if the par- two. Yeah, it's you're like, oh, what am I drinking this nope. wheel? You yes. <laughs> And then, heaven forbid, you put a peat sake next to that one. Oh, yeah. You can't even taste it. No, so. but, but on their own? Yeah. Standing alone. Good. All standing of them. alone, that can stand on its own mm-hmm. two feet for sure. Yep. All right. Y'all have a good night. Night, night. <laughs> bye bye.